Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Excellencies, uh, I wish you a warm welcome at the opening of the conference of uh, Center for Foreign Policy together for, with Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Nastavit ću da govorim na srpskom jeziku, mada je radni jezik ove konferencije engleski. Dozvolite mi pre svega da pozdravim sve uvažene goste koji su došli danas da razmene svoja razmišljenja o nama. Dakle, Friedrich Heber Stiftung i Centar za spolnju politiku već dugi niz godina sarađuju na temama od zajedničkog značaja. Kada kažem od zajedničkog značaja, u jednom trenutku mi se čini da smo prepoznali potrebu da izađemo iz okvira Zapadnog Balkana, dakle da se ne bavimo konstantno sami sobom, već upravo suprotno, da pogledamo šta je ono što se dešava u Evropskoj uniji, u kom pravcu se Evropska unija kreće i koji je krajnji ishod multiplih kriza sa kojima Evropska unija suočena. Od ishoda i raspleta ovih kriza u Evropskoj uniji zavisit će i budućnost Zapadnog Balkana. Prošle godine, kada smo organizovali ovu konferenciju, to je bio trenutak velike neizvesnosti za budućnost Evropske unije. Dakle, nalazili smo se neposredno pred odlučivanje, pred referendumom o izlasku Velike Britanije iz Evropske unije. Ishod ovog referenduma bio je veliko iznenađenje, čini se, za većinu analitičara. Još jedan događaj tokom protekle godine čini se da je predstavljao jednu vrstu iznenađenja, a to je izbor Donalda Trumpa za predsednika Sjedinjenih američkih država. 2017. godina posmatrana je kao godina presudna za budućnost Evropske unije, dakle, predizborni ciklusi u ključnim zemljama Evropske unije smatrani su kao nešto što će definisati budućnost Evrope u dužem vremenskom periodu. Danas, kada organizujemo ovu konferenciju, čini se da je ta neizvesnost mnogo manja nego što je to bila prošle godine i mnogo manja nego što smo to očekivali da će 2017. sa sobom doneti. Izbori u nekim od ključnih zemalja Evropske unije, kao što su Austrija, Holandija, ali pre svega Francuska, doveli su do nove nade da je budućnost Evropske unije moguća na nekim novim redefinisanim osnovama Dakle, da li je to Evropa u više brzina, mislim da će neki od današnjih govornika pokušati da nam približe. Dakle, u prvom panelu ćemo se upravo baviti time budućnošću Evropske unije. Dakle, trend porasta populizma antievropskih stranaka je zaustavljen i u ovom trenutku se otvara mogućnost da se unutrašnji odnosi u Evropskoj uniji redefinišu i to na osnovama toga da Nemačka koja svakako predstavlja pre svega lidera u u onom segmentu koji se odnosi na budućnost Zapadnog Balkana, ali i kada su druge odluke na nivou Evropske unije u pitanju, dakle, postoji šansa i mogućnost da se Francuska vrati onim prvim korenima kičme Evropske unije i da zajedničkim snagama krenu ne samo u redefinisanje Evropske unije, već i u promišljenje daljeg procesa proširenja, koje je za nas sasvim sigurno od od ključnog značaja. U Evropi više brzina, čućemo verovatno danas kako je zamišljen ovaj koncept, postavlja se pitanje da li postoji i jedna brzina za zemlje Zapadnog Balkana. Dakle, da li se mi nalazimo u nekoj brzini ili se nalazimo u rikvrcu, meni se čini da je ova godina još jednu stvar pogazala, da izostanak evropske perspektive ključno utiče na krize u zemljama Zapadnog Balkana. Dakle, Makedonija je eklatantni primer na koji način izostanak procesa evropskih integracija može uticati na deficit demokratskih potencijala u zemljama Zapadnog Balkana. 
Istovremeno Makedonija je pokazala još jedan važan moment, a to je činjenicu da je Evropska unija na određeni način zaokupljena sobstvenim krizama, izgubila instrumente uticaja u regionu na onaj način na koji ih je to imala ranije. To je, naravno, ostavilo prostor drugim akterima da na političke procese u regionu utiču na različite načine. Hoće li u periodu koji je pred nama Evropska unija pokazati snagu, moć i mogućnost da se vrati na ovaj prostor na način na koji je to na način na koji je to imala u prethodnom periodu, mislim da će veoma brzo u nekakvim kraćim vremenskim rokovima imati prilike da vidimo. Pitanje berlinskog procesa, berlinskog procesa Prus je nešto što nam daje nadu da postoji ideja, želja i potreba da se region Zapadnog Balkana integriše možda radije pre nego kasnije unutar evropske porodice. Umeđu vremenu, Zapadnom Balkanu je potrebno da završava svoje domaće zadatke. Dakle, Neophodno će biti da mi one okvire koji se od nas očekuju u smislu evropskih vrednosti, reformskih procesa, završavamo na takav način da onog trenutka kada se politički moment pojavi u Evropskoj uniji, da mi budemo spremni da postanemo punopravni članovi ove velike porodice. Ono što možemo reći je da... Evo, moj dragi prijatelj, kolega Dušan Reljić u jednom od svojih tekstova je rekao da nas čeka deset godina samoće. Ono što bih ja htela da kažem u ovom trenutku je da mi se čini da zapravo upravo negativni procesi sa kojima smo bili suočeni prethodni godina govore u prilog tome da je došlo do određene vrste otrežnjenja i razumevanja da je neophodno Zapadnim Balkanom baviti se konstantno, permanentno i da bez Zapadnog Balkana unutar evropskih granica ne može se obezbediti ono što je suštinska svrha Evropske unije, a to je stabilnost i bezbednost evropskog kontinenta. Gospodin Gabriel, ministar spodnjih poslova Evropske unije, u svojoj najavi Berlina Plus rekao je da moraju da Evropska unija mora u region investirati danas malo, kako sutra ne bi moral da investira mnogo više. Danas, kako bi to u naredne tri godine bio iskorišćen momentum, kako se ne bi izgubile decenije koje su ispred nas. Dakle, pozdravljam vas još jednom ispred Centra za spodnju politiku. Zahvaljujem vam što ste prepoznali važnost ove teme, što ste nam se pridružili u ovolikom broju danas. Zahvaljujem još jednom našem dugogodišnjem partneru, Friedrich Ebert Fondaciji, koja se čini da uvek na pravi način u pravom trenutku prepoznaje teme koje su od sustičtinskog značaja za region. Pozdravljam i gospođu Ursul Koh-Laugvic, koja je, ne mogu više da kažem nova, ali skoro došla šefica ofisa u Beogradu i pozivam je da vam se u ovom trenutku i ona obrati. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, special welcome today to all our speakers and panelists, and they are from Brussels, from Vienna, Berlin, Brussels, Budapest, Moscow, and all the capitals here in the region. On behalf of FES, I would like to welcome all of you to our traditional annual foreign policy conference in cooperation with the Center for Foreign Policy. Dear Alexandra, again, my personal thanks for your good cooperation and not only for yours, but your team as well. Our today's conference could be done in two events because both topics definitely deserve it. But they are intertwined, and I hope, or we hope, for very fruitful dialogue today. Alexandra explained from her position, and I will try 
to do it in a bit different way because uh, I'm a born European, thanks God. All my life, I grew up with a strong belief in the European Union, in those days starting with six members only, founded on the values of respect for human dignity, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, and many others. And as Europeans, we are used to take a lot of these benefits for granted. Peace, democracy, and the welfare state. But we, as well, in recent years, things started to change, and not to the better. And as the European Union marked its 60th birthday in March, the famous economist wrote that the European Union is in poor shape. A few months later, I would like to state today that Geert Wilders failed in the Dutch elections, and Marine Le Pen in France as well. The predicted big success of populists failed. But migration remains a huge issue, and the changed geopolitical environment matters as well a lot. And tendencies of illiberal democracy in some of the new member states should not be ignored any longer. Therefore, I agree, the European Union is facing huge challenges, but I'm sure it will not fail. A multi-speed union exists already. There are countless examples. Let me mention only some countries are staying out of the currency zone euro, the common security and defense policy, or Schengen, for example. And to judge by the headlines, things are getting pretty hairy in the Western Balkan 6 as well. I don't have the time to explore this in details again. The summit in Trieste in two weeks' time will discuss plans for a better, more intensive regional co common market, free trade, free circulation of labor and capital, and other important regulatory standardizations. And if European governments are busy debating what type of union they want after Brexit, Governments in the West Balkans should do as well. EU members on the other side reaffirmed in March that they expect the Balkan states to join the Union. It looks it could be on different terms, with new entrants starting out with only partial access and acquiring full membership status gradually. And as Alexander mentioned, after six months here in Belgrade, I would like to encourage all my Serbian colleagues to participate in this dialogue as members and representatives of sovereign states and subject, not victimized objects in all these debates. Thank you very much. Dozvolite mi da najavim obraćanje gospodina Ivice Dačića, ministra spolnih poslova. Ovo je njegovo suštinski prvo obraćanje u novom mandatu na mestu ministra spolnih poslova, obzirom na to da je morao otići u Dubrovnik na forum. On je specijalno za ovu priliku snimio poruku, odnosno ono što je želao da nam danas saopšti da je bio mogućnosti da bude prisutan. Drago mi je da ponovno mogu da se obratim na jednom ovakvom događaju organizaciji Centra za spoljnu politiku i fondacije Friedrich Ebert. Nova vlada Republike Srbije je upravo formirana. Ona će u pogledu spoljne politike zadržati naše spoljne političke prioritete. To znači da mi ostajemo kao pri našem osnovnom strateškom cilju, a to je Evropski put Srbije, koji podrazumeva ne samo evropske integracije, odnosno pregovore o članstvu, što znači jedan operativni 
proces otvaranja i zatvaranja pregovaračkih poglavlja. Ali ono što je možda još važnije, to je da to znači u stvari harmonizaciju našeg društva sa osnovnim vrednostima Evropske unije, što je mnogo važniji proces i što u stvari pokazuje jasno da mi naše evropske integracije ne vodimo zbog Evropske unije, nego pred svega zbog interesa Srbije i boljih života građana Srbije. U tom smislu, spoljnopolitičke prioriteti, kao što sam rekao, će ostati isti. Evropska unija, odnosno Evropski put Srbije, mir i stabilnost u našem regionu. Redefinicija političkih bilateralnih odnosa sa najznačajnijim svetskim faktorima na međunarodnoj političkoj sceni, tu mislim i na Sjedinje američke države, Veliku Britaniju, ali mislim i na zadržavanje prijateljskih odnosa sa Ruskom federacijom, Kinom i drugim zemljama koje, kad je u pitanju naš teritorijalni integritet i nešto što spada u domen zaštite naših nacionalnih i državnih interesa, imaju stavove koje nam u tome pomažu. Također, jedan od naših prioriteta će biti obraćanje pažnje na naše tradicionalne prijatelje. Bez obzira šta je ideološki ko mislio o prošlosti, treba negovati i možda obnoviti prijateljstva koje smo mi imali iz vremena Titova Jugoslava i pokreta nesvastanih sa čitim nizom zemalja, koji su i danas uglavnom prijateljski nastrojene prema Srbiji. To su zemlje Afrike, Azije, to su zemlje Latinske Amerike i to će također biti jedan od spoljnog političkih prioriteta naše zemlje. Kad je reč o Zapadnom Balkanu, mi ovdje na Zapadnom Balkanu u vreme kada na spoljnom političkom planu postoje mnogi novi izazovi, kao što je pobjeda Donalda Trumpa na predsjedničkim izborima u Americi, što je će možda značiti i redefiniciju spoljne politike iz nemaničkih država. Zatim Brexit, zatim rasprave u okviru Evropske unije koje govore o tome kakva će Evropska unija uopšte obstati, da li će obstati, ako obstaje, da li obstaje na ovim principima ili će se nešto menjati, da li će se uvoditi ono što su oni nazvali dve brzine politike, Neke zemlje u našem okruženju imaju i određene strahove, rekao bih čak fobije od tih najavljenih brzina i uopšte priče o Zapadnom Balkanu, naravno od priče o ekonomskoj uniji nas u regionu, zato što oni reaguju i boje se da će to biti neka priča o nekoj novoj Jugoslaviji ili, da tako kažem, o drugoj ligi Evropske unije. Tako da, kada je reč o Zapadnom Balkanu, Evropska unija je svakako ovdje mnogo popularnija nego čak i u nekim zemljama Evropske unije. Mi je i dalje vidimo kao do sada najuspešniji oblik saradnje i integracije država. Također mi je vidimo kao jednu uniju koja u kojoj postoje niz vrednosti koje su od kapitalnog značaja za svaku društvo, pa samim tim i za Srbiju. Sa druge strane, To je i jedan stabilizujući faktor za zemlje Zapadnog Balkana, zato što se ulazak u Evropsku uniju postavlja kao zajednički cilj. Tako da je višestruko korisna ideja Evropskog puta Zapadnog Balkana i mislim da Evropska unija bi trebalo mnogo više pažnje i prostora da posveti upravo tome, da posveti Zapadnom Balkanu. Zato nas i raduje berlinski proces, zato što on pokazuje da velike zemlje u Evropi drže na svojoj agendi Zapadni Balkan. Ta ideja je, kao što znate, započeta u Berlinu od strane kancelarke Angele Merkel, zato i mi zovemo berlinski proces, ali je ona kasnije nastavljena i u drugim gradovima i državama, kao što je bila Austrija, zatim Francuska, sada je Italija, već praktično za desetak dana, 12. jula će biti samit Evropi, Evropske unije i Zapadnog Balkana. Mi očekujemo da tu se naravno glavna stvar i glavna reč koja se može čuti nad svim tim sastancima jeste povezivanje. To znači i ekonomsko povezivanje, to znači infrastrukturno povezivanje, ali ja bih rekao da bi 
bilo dobro ukoliko bismo mi iznedrili i neku vrstu političkog povezivanja, pre svega da bi otklonili razne šumove u komunikacijama i vraćanju u prošlost između zemalja Zapadnog Balkana, ali i artikulisanje zajedničkih interesa koje bismo možda mogli zajedno i da zastupamo kada razgovaramo sa nekim iz Brisela. Odnosno da se malo više konstituišemo i definišemo kao neki region. Naravno da svi ovi planovi vezano za infrastrukturu, energetiku, telekomunikacije, oni ne mogu da budu ostvareni bez finansijske podrške. To znači i definisati da definisate određene fondove kako sve to ne bi ostalo neka prazna priča na papiru. Mi naravno imamo dosta primetbi na odnos Evropske unije prema našim evropskim integracijama zato što za razliku možda od nekih drugih zemalja Srbija ima određene i političke kriterijume u delu pregovora koji ne bi trebalo da budu politički. Znači, sada se ne odlučuje o tome da li će Srbija da bude primljena u Evropsku uniju ili ne, nego se odlučuje kojom brzinom mi prolazimo kroz poglavlja. Tu bi trebalo da bude osnova kako je naše zakonodavstvo, što treba da uradimo i da li smo uradili ili nismo uradili. Međutim, svaki naš korak napred se meri napredkom u poglavlju 35, odnosno u dialogu sa Prištinom, gde Srbija u najvećem broju slučajeva nije kriva za određene zastoje koje se tamo pojavljuju, već su krive vlasti u Prištini. Tako da se stvara jedan utisak da Srbija ne napreduje onolikom brzinom koliko bi trebalo, odnosno na koju je ona spremna, kad je reč o samim poglavljima, ali i sa druge strane se nameće jedan utisak da Evropska unija ne gleda pravedno kada procenjuje i kada daje ocen ili kada kritikuje pojedine aktere politike na Zapadnom Balkanu i mi imamo osjećaj da veoma olako se izriču ocene u Srbiji, a veoma teško se bilo što negativno kaže o nekima drugima čiji su potezi u proteklih nekoliko mjeseci ili godina značajno doprinosili povećanju tenzije na Zapadnom Balkanu. Ali, još jednom ponavljam, Naše osnovno predeljenje ostaje da mi idemo evropskim putem, naravno kroz ceo taj proces da štitimo naše državne i nacionalne interese i sa druge strane da budemo faktor, rezervuar ili kako se to kaže, izvoznik stabilnosti i bezbednosti u našem regionu. I to će biti upravo i politika nove vlade Srbije, naravno zajedno sa predsjednikom Republike Aleksandru Vučićem. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Ljubica Gojgić. I am a reporter with Radio Television of Vojvodina. And it is really an honor and great privilege to be here and to serve as a moderator of the first panel discussion today that is titled European Union in Redefining Years. Indeed, that is a topic that, and a process that we all are following with great anticipation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, I share um, your excitement about today's discussion and looking forward to hearing the reflections from our distinguished panelists. Uh, first of all, gentlemen, welcome to Belgrade. It is great having you here. And today with us uh, we have Mr. Hannes Svoboda, former member of the European Parliament, group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, uh, very well known in Serbia as well as a former rapporteur of the European Parliament for Croatia. Uh, we have also Mr. Karsten Vogt, former member of the German Bundestag of the SPD group. Hello. Uh, we have uh, here with us Mr. Dusan Relic, dear colleague, journalist, and today head of the office of German Institute for International and Security Affairs, currently in Brussels. We have Mr. Zoltan Pogača, economist and lecturer at the University of West Hungary. And um, we have Mr. Stephen Blockmans, who will be um, our keynote speaker today, and who will start, who will give actually uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of this um, uh, European Union in redefining years, and I'm sure will inspire 
the discussion that is to follow. Mr. Blockmans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, my thanks to the organizers, of course, uh, to the Center for Foreign Policy and the Friedrich Heber Stiftung for, for setting this up and inviting me back to, to Belgrade. It's a great pleasure and, of course, an honor to be able to provide the first impulse for our, uh, for our debate. And I would start with, um, with what seems to have become a common assumption, namely that the European Union is no longer in a state of existential crisis, that it has turned a corner, and that the only way is upward. Yes, let's hope so. Um, and indeed, there's reason to believe, on the basis of um, some of the recent elections and plebiscites, that, uh, that we have uh, turned that uh, corner. After the rise of populism, anti-immigrant, anti-EU uh, parties, Perhaps the Dutch proverbial boy has stuck his little finger in the dike and prevented the rest of the continent from being swept by this tide of populism. This reference is made to, uh, to the Austrian presidential elections. But let's wait for the legislative elections still coming up. Um, and then, of course, yes, uh, the victory of Emmanuel Macron and his, um, his new party movement turned party um, have indeed given the European Union a lease on life. We would have been in a very different spot had Marine Le Pen won the presidential elections and if we would have had a cohabitation or a hung parliament, if you want, uh, in, in France, um, and Le Pen having to make good on some of her campaign promises, at least. I mean, she gradually watered it down from a Frexit referendum to exit of the Eurozone, but she would have had a much more critical um, approach towards the European Union, and that would have thrown sand into the cogs of the European integration engine. So yes, Macron has shown, of course, that elections within the European Union can be won on a pro-EU ticket, and it's inspired some of the others, uh, Angela Merkel, for example, already in, in Germany, it seems, you know, to, to take um, a bit more assertive line um, than, than perhaps uh, she would have otherwise. So there is, there is reason uh, for hope that we might be getting into a stage of rebuilding again the European Union rather than further deconstructing it on the hands of the uh, populist iconoclasts. Uh, and recent opinion polls, of course, show that there is a rise in Euro-optimism around the European Union. I think the, the combined effect of the mess which Brexit and the Brexit government uh, have created for Great Britain, combined with the mess which Mr. Trump has created with his administration in the US, has not necessarily led to a rally around the EU flag, but it's certainly shown in opinion polls to have reflected into sometimes double-digit rise of, uh, of Euro uh, enthusiasm. And, and recent opinion polls, even by American pollsters, uh, pollsters, show that by and large, European Union citizens trust the European Union more than they do their own national authorities, that they trust and have hope in uh, the continuation of a single currency, that they see as one of the greatest benefits of the European integration process, the free movement, the investment which the European Union has made in their national economies, in their infrastructures, and that there is support, widespread support, for a wider security and defense project within, within Europe. Uh, and of course, the upcoming general elections in, in Germany may suggest that stability will be prolonged on that front and that a German, Franco-German engine of the European integration process will be able to rev up that integration motor and, uh, and steer it forward. But I would caution still, uncertainties remain in some key member states that will still hold elections. The Czech Republic is not necessarily thought of as such a key member state but consider the position it has within the V4, the Visegrad four countries, where it's still an outlier, a pro-European outlier, we could argue, amongst, uh, amongst those states. 
Now there, there will be elections in October of this year. You see an increasingly toxic electoral campaign being waged by all parties across the spectrum. You see almost Brexit-like rhetoric being recycled in this electoral campaign, as if the Czech Republic and their voters did not see what, has hap what had happened in, uh, in the United Kingdom, with anti-immigrant stances turning openly racist, with louder calls never to adopt the euro, um, with even talk of the introduction of the right to bear arms, guns, in the Czech Republic, US style. So you see really this, this populist, um, well, uh, reactory, uh, reactionary mode uh, still in f at full display. And as said, this might turn the V4 countries in a more obstructionist block uh, for European integration process. Another one would be Italy. Italy will be holding elections, general elections between now and the spring of 2018. Italy will probably this year pick up more refugees than last year. I mean, in last week alone, it's picked up more than 12,000 uh, refugees. And you see that the, um, the, the Democratic Party of Matteo Renzi uh, and Gentiloni are increasingly under pressure to take a much tougher stance towards the absence of any solidarity by, shown by other member states in the relocation system of refugees that have landed on Italian shores, and they might find, of course, support in that stance by, with, um, by Greece. So I would caution those that think that we are now out of the woods with the European integration process and, uh, and we can start building again. There is potential for further splits and for further agony, and the Brexit negotiations and the unshowing uh, budget negotiations for the European Union, which do not benefit from the UK's contribution to uh, the general budget, will mean a certain redistribution and therefore uh, a higher contribution by some of the member states, which will obviously um, be painful. So, Rather than saying that the EU is no longer in a state of existential crisis, I would, I would support the gist of that argument. I would rather say that the European Union is now in a state of suspended animation. And it will be in a state of suspended animation, I think, until spring 2018. Not just after the federal elections in, uh, in Germany, but for reasons that both have to do with the ongoing Brexit negotiations, which will start with the Brexit bill and will feed into a discussion on the next multi-annual financial framework of the EU, which will have to be uh, geared up by the, general, by the European parliamentary elections in June of 2019, and the Italian elections, which may take place between now and the spring. I think until then, we will be stuck in this suspended animation, or as the European Commission prefers to call it, a reflection period. A reflection period uh, which was initiated with a white paper offering scenarios for the future integration of the European Union, five scenarios, two of which are really only um, implementable, you could argue, because the status quo muddling through will essentially mean regression of the European Union, Whereas the, alt, the other extreme of the spectrum, full-blown federalism, will remain a pipe dream. And we'll buy scenario two, which is returning the European Union to the single market, is I think a station that has long been passed for many member states. Even if some self-declared counter-revolutionary leaders in Hungary and Poland would probably want to roll back the train to that station, and turn the European Union in a much more intergovernmentally led union. So there is this tension, obviously, between those that want to go forward into an ever closer union, even if the 28, when Cameron negotiated his deal, renegotiated settlement to try and keep the UK within the EU prior to the Brexit elections, the 27 agreed to, with the UK to an exception of that guiding 
principle for European integration, the one, uh, the, the, the ever closer union principle. And whilst that deal does not longer exist with the Brexit referendum, I think the genie is out of the bottle and may find its way back into future intergovernmental negotiations. What's the reform agenda for the European Union? I think it writes itself. We have ongoing problems and they, have, they will have to be addressed. And in fact, uh, Macrel, as they're sometimes called, I think it's a very hapless type of uh, conjunction of Macron and, uh, and Merkel. It doesn't really fit. Um, they have said that EU reform is in fact more important than Brexit negotiations. Merkel said so much in the Bundestag only a few days ago. And that EU treaty reform is no longer a taboo, which means that if solutions have to be found to the ongoing Eurozone crisis, to the ongoing stress which is on the Schengen border code and the free movement of people, to the desire to do more on security and defense issues in order to beef up the EU's own capacities in dealing with attacks on homeland by terrorists or the projection of force externally, I think around those teams there is enough political cap uh, capital to move forward and incidentally those are three domains in which we have multi-speed Europe already. And we may, we may in see, uh, indeed see a further, um, a further fleshing out of that, uh, of that concept of differentiated integration. Now all of this would have to wait, as I said, until roughly at least spring 2018. But there is already momentum towards further differentiated integration at this stage. In fact, as a result of the reassertion of Russian aggression towards Ukraine, its role in Syria, we've seen, um, we've seen that security and defense has uh, been much more seriously taken at the level of the European Council. It is translated in a, a strategic direction for the European Union in June of last year with the promotion of a, uh, a European global strategy. And in parallel, small but nevertheless significant steps towards further cooperation and integration in the security and the defense field. The December European Council adopted a so-called winter package which would ramp up those steps into concrete action and the European Council of last week in fact signed off on a couple of those. It recognized the fact that progress had been made with the creation of a military headquarters within the European structures, small, only for non-executive actions, meaning training missions of a military kind, with the creation of a European Defence Fund in order to enable well, member states who are able and willing, essentially, to use that fund and, uh, and develop European capabilities on a European scale, no longer at national level, with their own national defence industries. You have to think about European drones, satellite communication, air-to-air uh, -air refueling, those types of uh, heavy investment, which would be spurred by the European Union's uh, own defence fund. But we'll have to see how much money will come online and how much from the general budget of the EU will be matched by member states. So they're still careful. And I don't think, you know, uh, we should worry immediately about a militarized foreign policy of the European Union. As I said, very small steps are being taken. But significantly, perhaps, a treaty-based mechanism for permanent structured cooperation, or PESCO, which exists and which member states have, in the European Council of last week, in principle agreed to mobilize in order to allow a core group, probably around the Franco-German axis, to move forward in this field and the rest to remain on the sideline and maybe join that group, that core group, later. So we have, on the basis of the multi-speed Europe which already exists, small but significant steps which are being taken in a new field adding to the differentiated integration or if you want fragmentation of uh, the European Union. So that begs the question, well, what are the challenges and opportunities in this, uh, in this uh, respect? And ultimately the question will be what this means for, uh, for the Western Balkan states. 
I think first a conceptual point. Rather than talking about avant-garde, if you want, of core groups that go forward with the, the European integration process, an avant-garde which seems to suggest that this is a small group of states, I think we should think about the fact that this is rather a, um, a situation of arrière-garde, laggards that do not participate in what is essentially a majoritarian-led um, uh, uh, integration process. If you look at the differentiated integration modes which exist, Eurozone, Schengen, and uh, security and defense as, as may be in the, in the nearby future, it's always the same member states that seek exceptions in you know, more or less uh, similar configurations. Well, the most exceptionalist of those, the UK, will step out of the European Union and it may in fact have a signaling effect towards the others that I'd rather be on board than uh, lagging behind. So I think here the steps also in security and defense of late have been taken strikingly at 28, including the UK, which has so long slammed the brakes as far as further integration in the security and defense field is, uh, is uh, concerned. So what are the challenges there still? If you have, nevertheless, forms of differentiated integration, well, still loss of transparency, perhaps, which makes it more difficult, of course, to understand what the European Union is all about. It will be more difficult, perhaps, to explain also for uh, to, to citizens. Uh, on, conversely, one could say that it becomes much more clear in which policy domain certain member states, at least, participate. But it will be a challenge both in the institutional sense to keep unity and coherence of policy, as well as in the legal and procedural sense to keep an efficient and effective European Union going. So that's a challenge for sure. So rather than these multi-speed, you might get a kaleidoscopic European Union, where you look at the European Union and you, you twist you know, the, the kaleidoscope and then the member states, you know, the fragments, they, they, they come together in new clusters, and so that, that becomes a bit more difficult, perhaps, to understand. More worryingly, I think, are the political splits which may occur, and I alluded to this um, earlier. You have those pushing for, essentially, more political union through differentiated integration in areas which are very close to the sovereign hearts of member states, foreign policy, security policy, defense, Whereas others, the more sovereign-minded, perhaps the more protectionist-minded, uh, the self-declared counter-revolutionaries, as I said, want to keep the European Union where it is or maybe roll it back. The V4 may be such a more cohesive obstructionist bloc within their wake, countries like Bulgaria and Romania, and others, perhaps. So I wonder whether the east-west divide which existed prior to the Big Bang enlargement might resurface somehow. I mean, this has been the mantra of populists, especially in, VF in V4 countries, but it may become, in fact, some type of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Is the disciplining effect by Germany and France showing trailblazing in security and defense enough to keep that unity? That's, I think, an open question. And one of my final points, um, I think here, in order not to create those splits or harden those splits which may already exist, I think it is crucial that the rule of law agenda, which is more heavily imposed now for good reasons on Hungary and Poland, is played very carefully. Because here, those populist leaders that have been able to turn their movements into the power of government may actually use what they perceive as mobbing by the more powerful member states in the European Union to their own advantage in the domestic political debate and use that against um, the, the European integration process so as to isolate themselves even further. Now, that is ultimately not only contrary to the rule of law 
in itself, because that detrimental situation might be prolonged. But it's ultimately also detrimental, I think, to the political cohesion which is formed in a consensus-seeking organization, which is the European Union. And so there it is important that uh, the European Union, of course, which is a community based on law, protects those fundamental values on which it is based from further erosion, while at the same time keeping it politically uh, operational um, and, uh, and unified. Opportunities, and that's my final, final point, is of course to deepen and widen the European integration process at the same time. Deepening is clear, widening, well, not only because you have a majority of member states forging ahead, but potentially even tying in non-EU member states. This might be the case for Britain in the Brexit negotiations, but it may also be for the case for Southeast European countries. Is this daydreaming? I don't think so. If you look at Schengen, you have a number of non-EU member states, like Norway, Iceland, benefiting already from incorporated mechanisms and the extension, basically, of those zones of free movement. So it's not impossible to think that over time, even prior to full-blown accession, states on the neighbor in the neighborhood of the European Union, including pre-accession states, could already be tied into uh, integrated, differentiated integration modes of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blockman, for this thorough analysis. Um, that started on a very positive note. Uh, instead of speaking about crisis, uh, you spoke about rebuilding the EU, and then you moved to something less optimistic. Uh, I think we all will remember the phrase suspended animation, uh, animation or reflection period, and I would like to hear um, Mr. Svoboda's thoughts on, on Europe being in a mode of suspended animation. Uh, the EU hasn't seen that uh, so far in its, in its history, right? Thank you very much. Well, the question is, where is the, the more important, what is the more important point, the suspension or the animation? So that's, that's uh, the issue. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and to participate in this uh, interesting debate. And thanks, uh, Stephen, for his very, I think, valuable and realistic uh, presentation. You know, when I joined the European Parliament in 1996, uh, and all, most of the 18 years, not all the 18 years, but most of the 18 years, I was thinking, okay, that's Europe, and we have just to build up, build up, build up. The basis has been done. It's always going in one direction, maybe in different speeds, uh, but it should not be too different, and that's, at the end of the day, we will see you know, the paradise uh, developed uh, uh, by strengthening and, of course, also extending the European Union. Now, things become differently, and I fully agree with what Stephen said about the multi-speed, but also the multi-track or the kaleidoscopic uh, view we have to take. Europe, it would be very good if we could you know, build the European state or let's say the United States of Europe, as it was always many times, I was asked, are you for the United States of Europe? And I said, what, what would it be? Because even the United States of America has something, some elements more central than Europe, but some elements more decentral than Europe. So it's not to have one pattern. We have to get used. It's not one pattern we can uh, implement, but we have to find in a sometimes even in muddling through system to find the development, of course, which is going forward. But forward does not always mean even more decision taken uh, on the European level. Yes, in some elements, yes, but we have to differentiate where we need more Europe. Foreign security policy is one of the issues where we need more Europe inside the Eurozone. I'm very grateful for the proposal of Emmanuel Macron, and I also find possibilities that um, Macron and Merkel or Schulz, whoever will win the election, can work together. We have to say that at least there's one election where whatever is the result, it's a pro-European result, so that's uh, for once uh, a very good thing. 
and that we have to get used that there will always be crises. Of course, it's like when you have start a partnership, a private partnership, or you get married, and in Germany since this morning, even you can have same-sex marriages, you don't think about the crisis. You think about, you know, it will go well from year to year, it will be even better. But sometimes it does not go that way. But you have to manage it in a way. Maybe, and hopefully without separation, like the Brexit, but you have to manage crisis. And we are not used enough, in, like in private, also in politics, to manage crisis in a, in a decent way. So this is the first point I think we have to do. Who could manage the crisis? I'm, you know, in, in, until recently, until the recent uh, election in France, it was Germany. And I always said, I'm supporting Germany, but I was happy, and I realized in European Parliament that the German members of the Parliament, not only of my political group, the socialists, but also the others, but especially the socialists, were always in the forefront of integration process. But if it's only one country, even if it's a leading country, it's not enough. And I think Carsten will agree. If there's at least a second country, and that was my big disappointment with, uh, with François Hollande, uh, we need a second country. And of course we need other countries. But finally, also the member countries and the not yet member countries have to decide what way they want to go. Do they want to go a way which is promoting not only individual freedoms, economic success, uh, openness of the society, or not? We should, we should not always say that this develop is, there's only one development possible. No, there are different developments possible. And that has to be very clear. We have to make choices. The more we take things for granted, they will go anywhere this way, the more we will have to be confronted with some crisis and some challenges which um, we probably have not yet uh, uh, managed enough. May I come back to what Ivica Dacic said? I know Ivica Dacic from... Um, when he was still a young functionary of uh, Milosevic's party and followed him and had many talks when he was Minister of Interior and now Minister of, of, of Foreign Affairs. Um, I think he made it very clear what is the difference between the strategic target for Serbia and of course for the rest of the region and what is friendship and relationship. I find it very strange very often if, if EU journalists, politicians ask so you to have to choose between friendship for Russia and friendship for European Union. No, that's not the choice. You should be a friend of Russia, you should have a dialogue with Russia. But the choice is the strategic choice. The strategic choice is either you want to have a society development which is in the, going in the direction of European Union with all the deficiencies the EU has. I don't want to, to, you know, to paint a, a very rosy picture. Or you go the other societal model. That is the choice. Not the political choice of friendship or not friendship. Even the, the, the choice of sanctions or not sanctions is not so important. And here I see some ambivalence very often in, in, in some of the Balkan countries, including Serbia, to, to have different words, but at the mindset very often well, here's the EU, here is Russia, here is China, here is, we have relationship with African countries. Yeah, you should have relations with everybody. But at the end of the day, you make yourself clear what you want. And I think the EU should all not take it for granted that Serbia wants to join European Union. If they want, yes, welcome. And we should do more to, to give an incentive. But at the end of the day, uh, we should Make, uh, should give it uh, the, the country and the politicians the country the choice what they want to do and which way they want to go. In that sense, uh, I think it's, it's very important also what uh, uh, the, the role of the values. Of course, we have to recognize that in the European Union we have also the values challenged. Uh, Mr. Orban is challenging the value of the Polish government. Mr. Fico is challenging the values of the European Union. And therefore, I'm very happy, not only from the substance of what the decision of the German Bundestag this morning on the same-sex marriage is not this, you know, symbolic, it's a symbolic element of it. We go forward with giving people individual freedom, uh, give the people the choice, uh, and not going backwards. Sometimes I have the feeling in some of the countries, people want to go backwards. 
instead of going forward. What was the basic idea on the value side of European Union? The basic idea was, yes, all the countries had victims and were victims of certain developments. But all the countries should also think they were perpetrators and they have to see both sides. I say that because this morning I made a walk here and I saw this small uh, monument for the children victims of the, of the NATO bombing. It is good to have a monument on that. And I saw then the pictures in front of the, of the parliament here of uh, the Albanian, well, it's a wrong expression in that sense, of the Albanian perpetrators and why EU and NATO is supporting Albanian perpetrators in the Kosovo. You also can say that there were, there were Albanian, uh, Kosovo Albanian perpetrators and, and the cruel uh, activities. But a country has not only to remember when they were victims, a country has also to remember when they were perpetrators. And that is true for all the countries, because there is no country in European Union, I don't know any country in European Union who were not also perpetrators in Europe itself, in the colonial world, and we are still suffering from that. And this is what I mean, we should not forget with all the economic aspects, and I'm very much in favor of of going uh, forward with the investments. And I hope that the Trieste Summit will also show some of the examples where the European Union is helping even more to invest in the Balkans. But I think we should not forget that the European Union is a union also based on values. And this is one example which I just uh, mentioned. Now, what will be the future? Um, you know, we have all still in our mind, the critical remarks of uh, the President of the European Commission, Juncker, when he said during this period of his commission and this uh, European Parliament, there will be no accession from Balkan country. On the one hand, it was self-evident. Everybody knew it will not be. On the other hand, sometimes when you say the self-evident things, they have a, long, a wrong, uh, they give a wrong message. The message was seen at least in the region, but not only in the region. You are in the waiting room, wait, continue to wait and be patient. Don't bother us with too much demands from your side. Uh, and I think that was the wrong message uh, to be taken. And we have to be more engaged from the European side to give, irrespective of our own problems, which have been very well described by Stephen, so I have to, don't, to go into, into details. Um, that we have to help our neighbors if they want to go the European way. I still think the majority wants, but it should be clearly said also by, by the countries concerned. And here I think we have to think about intermediate steps. Now, intermediate steps may also be interpreted as means to keep you away for another year or another period. But I think what uh, Stephen also said about, um, for example, Schengen. You know, we have the crazy situation that all of a sudden Slovenia even, you know, raised uh, the border controls, and they had to do it in some way because of Schengen between Slovenia and Croatia. And all of a sudden, on a special weekend some weeks ago, long queues of people having to wait uh, to cross the Croatian-Schengen border. And then people asked, this is Europe? This is Europe, why? this is why we, change, we joined the European Union. And on the other hand, you have, of course, the difficulty between, uh, between uh, Croatia and uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. So I, I don't see why not, in the interest of Europe, in the interest of the so-called closing of the Balkan route, it would be much better and much uh, be a progress if you would de deliberately organized to go in the way of, of including the Balkan countries into the Schengen zone, of course, with the help of European Union. And then finally, and that will be the end, and finally also, at the same time, create what we really need, a European control and supervision of the common border. Because we have this, this very strange situation with a common border, but no control of the border by European Union activities, because Frontex is much too small and too weak. So what is on Schengen, you could also say on the economic field to go more in that direction. So um, to be realistic, 
I don't know when the next uh, move will come. I don't know when Montenegro will be ready. I don't know even what, if European Union countries will say, okay, we have a separate joining the European Union by a country with about 800,000 inhabitants. But we should take and, and, and take into uh, action activities where the countries are closely, step by step, integrated in the European Union, even before the full membership. Not in order to say goodbye to full membership, but in the preparation to full membership. Otherwise, a too long period is here, and otherwise, of course, the forces will win in some of the countries to say, look, Europe, they don't take it serious. They don't really want us. Why should we go there? Let's orient it to another country. So even in that sense, helping the countries of the region could help European Union to solve one of the issue, and one of the issue, of course, is the issue of the Schengen border, and, that, and therefore I would fully under, underline what Stephen said on this issue, and then we can talk up also about other activities. Thank you very much. Mr. Vogt, how do you comment on this, um, on this uh, uh, image that uh, um, it seems that people have uh, seeing Germany as sort of a savior of the, of the EU in these in this redefining, uh, re redefining years? Now, with the help, presumably, uh, from, from France and, and few others. I like the image. <laughs> when I was a child, this was different. I studied German occupation policy, and I studied in Denmark at the Danish Institute for Occupation Policy, and every time something nasty was discussed, everybody looked at me how I reacted. I like this change, but this is too much. Germany cannot save the European Union, and even France and Germany together, their cooperation is needed can only do it if they respect the interest of other countries, especially also of small and medium-sized countries. So that's my direct answer. The second remark, and not an answer, partially an answer, I will make in direction of Alexandra. You mentioned the speech of Gabriel in Berlin. I was attending this conference when he was making his speech, and there is a positive and a negative side to it. The negative side is not only Gabriel, but many people in Germany across party lines are concerned about certain crisis elements which you can see in the Western Balkans. Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, and certain Kosovo, certain elements there. And we, this is concern, that's a negative element. And we think we need to give the Western Balkans more attention. <laughs> That's a positive aspect. Not Germany alone, hopefully the French as well, and many others as well. But we need to pay more attention to the, this region. And we also have to think about incentives for a better development. But yes, there are some incentives, and sometimes we are more flexible than we seem. Last week, uh, the German parliament made a decision unnoticed, by the way, in German public, <laughs> that the linkage between that the IMF should be part of the package deal in favor of Greece, the monetary faculties, they accepted this compromise in Greece without the IMF being part of it. So sometimes even our finance minister Schäuble is more flexible than he wants to admit before elections. And I expect more flexibility on some aspect of Greek tax after the German elections, whoever is in government. It, so there is an incentive element which might be there. But incentive is not a substitute for the necessity of domestic reform. And this is, should also be clear that if you want to join the European Union, you must do it because you want to be modern and not only because you want to be nice with some European countries. And uh, I think this debate is, uh, is some, sometimes going in the wrong direction, in, not only in Serbia, but in this part of uh, the Balkans. Second point which I want to make is Russia was mentioned. I would mention 
United States as well. I have been chairman of the German-Russian parliamentary group for a long time. I, before I ever was in the United States, I was in the Soviet Union. But later on, I was for roughly 10 years the German-American coordinator in the Foreign Office, dealing with the United States, which always is a difficult but also important partner during the Bush years. And there I will describe the difference between an alliance between France and strategic orientation. For us Germans, the EU is the most important foreign policy issue. The United States is the most important partner outside the European Union. Russia is the most important partner and sometimes challenge east of the European Union. Which means, if we take the European Union and its destiny so important, then if a country is arguing against the cohesion inside the European Union, as it sometimes was the case in the election campaign of Trump, we perceive it as a hostile act. And I say that as the former person being responsible for good relationship with the United States, which I want also to continue in the future. But it's a relationship being based on principles and priorities. And this priority is European Union. And I want in the future, hopefully once, closer economic relationship with Russia as again. Our trade is not going bad. So it's not uh, going in the wrong direction. It's growing again. And hopefully, or even with the Eurasian Union. But if Putin is subsidizing anti-European parties, it's a hostile act. And I think you, in the West Balkans and Serbia especially, have to decide between these two elements. You have to be friendly and try to be friendly with Russia. But if Russia tries to block your relationship with the European Union, you have to decide which priorities you have. And this is what you mentioned and which I want to explain in a sharper way, so to say. Then, two-speed Europe. We have not a two-speed Europe, we have a several-speed Europe. But there is a difference between different degrees and different types of relationship when you are outside or when you are inside. When you are outside, you can have a relationship like the Norwegian. Practically, they are member, but they are members without voting rights inside. And they have to decide it because they want to stay outside to accept the European norms even without prior voting rights in the Norwegian Storting. That's how the name of the parliament is. Then you have the relationship of the Turks. You will have a future relationship of the British where you cannot pick and choose, but give and take. You cannot have it both ways. And naturally, in such a relationship, for example, also with Ukraine and association treaties, you can all have all types of relationships. The European Union is very flexible and will be flexible. And if you want that as a substitute for membership, there will be an utmost flexibility. If you want it as a pretext to membership, you have not to lose the perspective. And the perspective of different speeds inside the European Union is something different. For at least from a German point of view, we have a common vision. This is the vision of a European Union which can act on global scale. I do not want to be praised in Washington because I say yes. I want to be respected it because my yes and no matters. And my yes and I personally think, unlike the British, that Germany is too small to matter alone on the world scale, when we deal with China and the Americans and others, that then we would only be an object of policy and not a subject of policy. And therefore, I think that the European Union is an idea which gives us a say on global scale and where the Europeans, based on common norms, principles and values, define their common space. That's why common norms, principles and values are so important. And therefore, if we have go a step, the step which is not accepted by everybody at the beginning, when you have this goal of a common destiny, 
In principle, this type of cooperation must be open for everybody in the European Union. This is not for those who are outside. They can pick and choose or give and take. Inside, the goal must be also the Eurozone, also Defense Union, also Schengen, must be perspective, perspective being open for everybody. Some people might join it before they are full members or cooperate with it. For example, the British, I expect, will cooperate with the Defense Union in all likelihood. But it's a difference whether you have the common perspective or not. So the common perspective must be there. And this must that if there is um, this closer cooperation between European Union countries, the basic principle must be it should be open to everybody. And the goal must also that everybody is joining it. Because why? Because this deeper cooperation is only an element of intergovernmental cooperation. In intergovernmental cooperation, you have the control of national parliaments, but not a real control of the European Parliament. If you have an idea about the common European goal, at least I, not everybody, but at least I have the vision that in the perspective also the European Parliament has a say. And that in the perspective not only the Council, but also the Commission as the guardian of the integration process has a say. And if we talk about this different, these different speeds, I can think about the whole variant. We have now Frontex. By the way, crisis situations are not only a risk, they're also an opportunity. As a result of the financial crisis, banking crisis, we got the banking oversight, which was impossible before. We got certain European funds to avoid such a future crisis. Now we have the refugee crisis, and Italy should get more solidarity. But we, in this refugee crisis, countries who are skeptical about deeper integration are quite of a sudden in favor of Frontex, which is a common border control unit of the European Union. And we have now, which many countries rejected in the early years, now a discussion about the European Defense Union. And this European Defense Union will not substitute NATO. And it will not substitute our alliance with the United States. But we will find out, and I am very optimistic in that context, that Kaczynski, who didn't invent the European Union, who was not born in support of the European Union, and not elected in support of the European Union, because he doesn't want, he is against such a core group. But if there is such a core group who coordinates the defense policy, he, he does not want Poland to be outside the core. And that, I think, could also be the case for some other countries who are skeptical about further integration, that they are in principle against such core groups, but if they can't prevent it, then they might join it. And this is a perspective which we might see in the context of the Defense Union, which we might see in the, uh, in the context of Frontex, which we see now in the context of the general European prosecutor, also an instrument which is very often overlooked. And when you in, in Serbia discuss these issues, and also in a couple of neighboring countries, you should, not only, uh, be, uh, you should not only be disturbed by all these different terminologies and all these different instruments and these different steps. Always keep in mind, which perspective do you have? Do you want to be a full member? If you want to be a full member, then you have to prepare yourself to a common vision. And naturally always, it's people when they accept your membership, they will not accept it easily if from the very outset they see that you are a problem and not a problem solver. So you must see whether you want this perspective. Then secondly, what you want to contribute and which place you want to play inside the union. And finally, let me conclude by that. As I have said, I studied in Scandinavia. Scandi Norway is a relatively small country. When you look how big the impact of Norway was on NATO, when you look how big the impact of Luxembourg is on the European Union, they are pro when you only look at their numbers, population, financial strengths, you know, they are very rich, but uh, I mean financial strengths compared with a neighboring country or two neighboring countries is limited. This is a country which, because of its pro-European history, is always making proposals, also Belgium and the Dutch. 
And there are some countries who only react when a new proposal is made by the French or by the Germans or some others. There are other countries who initiate those ideas and who see them not only suffering from the power of the big countries which influence their history and which have made secret agreements about spheres of influence, but you don't have this neurosis, which I understand in historical terms, but to think, what is our role? Where want, do we want to go? How far can we reach it? And what ha do we have to change to reach our goal? And which role will we afterwards play when we once have become a member? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Radic, speaking about the future, I would like to invite you to go a little bit to, a little bit to the past. Uh, when Mr. Blockmans mentioned kaleidoscope, I remember uh, kale kaleidoscope, I, is, is, that, yes. is that the word? The, the, the small little uh, uh, toy for children where you look and you see different pieces forming uh, various, uh, various images, but it's a mosaic. It's, it, it's not, the picture is not a whole, it's a mosaic. And that little toy is called kaleidoscope. Well, what I wanted to, what I wanted to ask Mr. Redic is uh, that, um, uh, one, I've heard yesterday at another conference, once you start speaking about Europe, not as a whole, but as of kaleidoscope, are you starting along the path of ex-Yugoslavia? Are you facing the scenario, are you breaking something that was good and starti starting um, uh, towards that risky path? Ljubic, ja ću da govorim na mom maternjem jeziku, jer je većina učesnika ovdje ipak, mislim da ćemo se lakše sporazumeti. U opremi nekog pripadnika instituta društvenih nauka, jer je Think Tanka nije kristalna kugla. I gledanje u kristalnu kuglu i proricanje budućnosti ne ide tako lako, pa bih možda u ovom trenutku izokola pokušao da se približim odgovoru na vaše pitanje. I tu bi se pozvao na to što je Aleksandar Joksimović spomenuo na početku na taj tekst iz 2012. godine koji smo napisali u Berlinu i koji se zvao Deset godina samoča i odnosio se na brzinu mogućnosti pristupanja zemalja Zapadnog Balkana i Evropskoj Unije. Mi smo bili vrlo neoprezni i nismo imali kristalnu kuglu pri ruci, ali da smo imali i da smo bili oprezni, rekli bi smo najmanje 25 godina samoče i onda bi smo bili on the safe side, što bi se rekli. Tako i mi je i ova rasprava, jako je u njoj bio oprezni optimizam sve vreme naglašen, mislim da jednu suštinsku stvar nije dotakla, da uzrok krize Evropske unije i uzrok krize integracije Evropske unije nije bio na diplomatskom nivou, da su se gospodža Merkel i gospodin Olan loše sporazumevali, ili da je gospodin Orban tako negativno nastrojen prema Europskoj uniji, mislim da su ono što se jednim možda malo starijim mlječnikom naziva društveno-ekonomska kretanja u poslednje vreme bila ta koja su proizvela krizu Europske unije, a pre svega da ono što je koncept Europske unije u glavama većine ljudi, a to je rast blagostanja, rast jednakosti u društvu, jednakih šansi, da se to nije dogodilo, već suprotno. Već dugo vremena mi gledamo kako nejednakost raste u većini društava Evropske unije. Pogledajte radove Tome Piketija, pogledajte Branka Milanovića sa izvanrednim analizama o tome kako je nejednakost porasla svuda, i u Nemačkoj, koja je inače vrlo dobro prošla kroz ekonomsku krizu. Ako pogledate najnovije istraživanja nemačkih sindikata o vrednostnim sistemima radništva u Nemačkoj, vidjet ćete da netrpeljivost prema drugima, sklonost ka autoritarnom razmišljanju, raste uprkos tome što je društveni, što je Nemačka tako dobro prošla poslednjih godina. I ja mislim da je to suštinski problem da Evropska unija nije uspela da ubedi većinu ljudi da će budućnost biti bolja, ono što je polazilo bez većih problema za rukom 50. i 60. i 70. godina. I dokle god, posebno oni koji su na margini društva, kojima je objektivno gore, čija deca 
nemaju više tako dobre šanse kao što su oni imali u životu. Dakle, god oni prepoznaju da ni Brisel, ni Berlin, ni bilo ko drugi njima ne nudi tu garanciju da će biti bolje, vidjet ćemo kako će te krize, sad se ja osuđujem, vidim u kristalnu kuglu, kako će kriza oscilirati, kako će se pojavljivati. Nije Steven Blockman slučajno spomenuo parlamentarni izbore u Austriji, koje mogu odjednom taj oprezni optimizam koji smo imali da preokrenu jednu sa svim drugačiju stranu. Šta to znači za ovaj region, za takozvani Zapadni Balkan? Čuli smo i od gospodina Svobodi, od gospodina Fokta, da je možda prioritet za ovaj region da se pozabavi time da vrednosti koje nudi Evropska unija preuzme, asimilira. Ja mislim, međutim, da jedno stanje, jednu vrednost, ovaj region je bitno preuzeo time što se otvorio prema Evropskoj uniji kroz porazum asociaciji pridruživanja, a to je društvena nejednakost. Društvena nejednakost je tokom poslednjih otpada socijalizme, od kad su uvedene, kako da ih nazovemo, ipak kapitalistički sistemi, u ovom regionu drastično porasli. Srbija, konkretno prema svim istraživanja, spada među društvima u Evropi koji imaju najveću nejednakost. Jedna vrlo bogata vrhuška i jedan veliki deo društva koji je zapravo siromašan oko trećine ljudi u Srbiji je na granici siromašta, oko polovina ljudi u Srbiji je ugrožena siromaštvo. Tako da ta konvergencija, približavanje sistemu vrednosti, socioekonomskom sistemu Evropske unije, se nije dogodilo. Umesto toga, mi gledamo posebno od dužničke krize, financijske krize 2008-2009. godine, divergenciju, raskorak. I naravno da se taj raskorak onda iskazuje i kroz političke ubeđenje kroz veliko podozrenje prema Evropskoj uniji, prema afinitetu prema Evropskoj uniji, prema autoritarnim sistemima. I ja sam zadivljen da je dalje od 48 odsto ljudi u Srbiji podržava ulaze po Evropskoj uniji. To je odličan rezultat. Kolega Jović može mi pomogne, kada je bio referendum u Hrvatskoj, 28 odsto ljudi koji su imali pravo glasa su glasali za ulaze po Evropskoj uniji. Zašto? Zato što je Hrvatska prošla kroz 14 godina bez prirednog rasta, jer je bila najotvorenija zemlja prema Evropskoj uniji. Ono što mislim da svima nama nedostaje kada razmišljamo o tom odnosu između perif, između jugoistočne Evrope i središta Evropske unije, mi ne razmišljamo, ne govorimo o tome kao jedinstvenom prostoru, single space. A zapravo, takozvani Zapadni Balkan, ni na koji način nije nešto van Evropske unije. Zapadni Balkan je zapravo, možete to nazovete, mekanim trbuhom Evropske unije, ako želimo jedan drastičan pojem. I to već počinje od geografije. Vi kad putujete iz Evropske unije, iz Hrvatske u Evropsku uniju u Grčku, vi prolazite kroz taj region. Vi kad letite, idete iznad tog regiona. To nije susedstvo, no neighborhood. To je unutra u Evropskoj uniji. I to se već osjeća I po ljudima, četvrtina stanovništva ovoga regiona živi u Evropskoj uniji. Rezidencijalnog stanovništa regiona se odselilo u Evropsku uniju, zbog boljih šans u Evropskoj uniji. To znači istovremeno da doznake iz Evropske, gastarbajtere iz Evropske unije, čine i do trećine društvenog proizvoda ovog regiona. Opadne li u Nemačkoj privredna konjunktura za vrlo malo, To se multiplikuje pet, šest, sedam puta kroz doznake gastarbajtere u negativnom smislu u regionu. To se posebno odnosi na trgovinu. 85% trgovine Zapadnog Balkana je sa zemljama Evropske unije, konkretno zapravo sa Nemačkom i Italijom. A onda dolaze u mnogo manjem nivou Austrija, Mađarska, Grčka i šta ja znam. 90% bankarskog sektora regiona pripada Zapadnoevropskim bankama. To su nemačke banke, austrijske banke, francuske, nešto malo grčke i mađarske. Investicije uglavnom dolaze iz zemalja Evropske unije. I zapravo kad pogledamo zavisnost ovog regiona od stanja u Evropskoj unije, je veća nego što je nemačka zavisna. Nemačka ima oko 50% trgovine sa zemljama zapadne, sa zemljama Evropske unije, ovaj region ima 80%. Ako pogledate stepen preuzimanja 
vrednosti na osnovu kojih je oblikovan socioekonomski sistem u ovom regionu, a to je taj čuveni vašingtonski konsens, znači liberalizacija tržišta, privatizacija tržišta, politika štenje u svakom slučaju. U ovim zemljama udeo države i javnih izdataka u društvenom proizvodu je negde 30 do 40 odsto, u Nemačkoj je udeo države u javnim izdatacima preko 50 odsto. Znači, ove zemlje su u jednom ubrzanom procesu preuzele suštinske vrednosti sistem, društveno-ekonomskog sistema koje postoje. Oni sada kroz preuzimanje AKI-a, pravnog sistema Evropske unije, rezolucija Evropske unije, akcija Evropske unije, pokušavaju još da se prilagode. Ali suštinski proces reformi, suštinsko opredeljenje koji društveno-ekonomski sistem želite, se odavno ne o pozivu dogodi u ovim regionima. Ovaj region ne može da ode odavde nigde. On ne može da postane deo zajednice sa Rusijom i Belorusijom. Ako 25% ljudi ovog regiona živi u Evropskoj uniji i 85% trgovine ide s njim. Problem, međutim, jeste da jako je ovaj region u mnogim stvarima već učestvu u integracijonim procesima Evropske unije. Kao što su programi Erasmus, kao što su programi naučnog istraživanja, kao što je Evropska unija u avijaciji, šta znam, Ovaj region nema jedan suštinski element integracije u Evropsku uniju, a to je učešće u strukturnim fondovima koji kompenzuju otvorenost tržišta. Od 2005. do 2016. godine, to znači da poslednjih deset godina, šest malenih zemalja Zapadnog Balkana ostvarilo je trgovinski deficit sa Evropskom unijom, sa Nemačkom i sa Italijom, od skoro 100 milijardi evra. Što znači da iz ovog regiona 100 milijardi društvenog proizvoda preneto u suštinske zemlje Evropske unije, u core countries of the European Union. A kompenzacija za tu otvorenost tržišta kroz strukturne, učešće u strukturnim fondovima, kroz mogućnost dolaska do besplatnog kapitala i svega toga, se nije dogodilo. Poljski ministar i nosnovi poslove nedavno dao intervju Špigl i novina Špigla ga je pitao dobro, Zašto ste vi tako protiv Evropske unije kada ste vi najveći korisnik strukturnih fondova Evropske unije? A poljski ministar na osnovni postoje rekao Nemačka godišnje proda Poljskoj 100 milijardi evra vrednosti robe. I to što učestvujemo u kompenzacijonim fondovima je samo kompenzacija za to što smo se otvorili. Ove zemlje nemaju kompenzaciju, ove zemlje nastavljaju zapravo da svoj društveni proizvod šalju ka jačem centrima ekonomske moći i ja se bojim ako pogledamo zaduženost tih zemalja, da preti grčki scenarij, a Zoltan Pogača je napisao izvanrednu knjigu o grčkom scenariju i uzricima, tako da on može o tome malo više da govori. Ja mislim da je sad možda poslednji trenutak da se preobrati taj trend, da se, pošto su pripreme za naredni izbor Evropskog parlamenta 2019. za novi, što je Steven Blokmans govorio, za novi budžet Evropske unije, Ja mislim da nekim političkim odlukama bi trebalo da se razmisli o tome da se jedna vrsta, ne volim taj izraz mašalovog plana, ali jedna vrsta investicijonog podsticaja regionu omogući, jer Svetska banka je izračunala. Ako ovaj region bude rastao sa 6% godišnje, onda će krajem 30. godina dostići prosek Evropske unije. Region sad, posle dugog niza godina za ostajanje stagnacije, raste sa klimavih 3%. To može u svakom trenutku da zastane. A nedostatak društvenog rasta, i nemojte me sada obtužiti za ekonomski determinizam, ali to je ono što otvara nejednakost, to je ono što otvara sklonost populizmu, to je ono što ljudima stvara iluziju da te brze odluke koje obećavaju Trump ili Putin ili ti razni populisti, da to može da reši probleme. I zato, kao što je Evropska unija usvojila cilj, i ne samo Evropska unija, dva odsta umanjenja, zagađenja, klime, da bi se klima spasila, ja mislim da treba da se usvoji cilj šest odsta rasta za zemlje Zapadnog Balkana, da bi smo izbjegli grčki scenarijo i zamke populizma i autoritarne vlasti. Hvala gospodine Reliću. Mr. Pogača, you are now in a perfect position. You can comment on all. 
you can pick which, uh, 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 which topic you, you prefer. I would like, uh, however, to ask you about uh, coming from Hungary, from that um, enfant terrible of the EU, uh, how do you see how do you see this um, this this new Europe um, of several several speeds? What would be the place of Hungary in it? And uh, how do you see uh, already raised uh, uh, concerns from the Eastern European members that um, even the idea of creating groups within a group means dissolution? Okay, I saw that coming somehow. Um, I want to I want to start by saying that I think in order to understand what goes on in the EU, um, it's not enough to talk of countries. I think we should move beyond uh, the times when we talked of EU integration as France wants this, Germany wants that, Hungary wants that. Um, <clears throat> countries are not actors. Countries have processes within them, uh, which are incredibly important, uh, between social groups who are very diverse and want very different things. And one of the reasons, I think, why we don't understand <clears throat> what goes on at the European level is that we keep thinking in terms of countries being actors, which I think is false. Um, second thing is, I think that the EU has basically broken down into three blocks. There's a three-way split in Europe, as far as I can see it. Uh, there is a northern core centered around Germany with uh, Netherlands, Austria, a couple of other countries which are the uh, beneficiaries of the last 10, 15 years, especially of the Eurozone. Uh, and there is a southern bloc which has obviously collapsed and is still, in spite of austerity, or I would say because of the austerity, in a very, very difficult situation. Countries like Greece, Italy not getting better, Ireland getting better in spite of the austerity rather than because of the austerity, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a periphery there uh, in the south. Uh, and there is an eastern periphery, uh, a kind of Visegrad, Central Eastern European periphery, which is of different characteristics. Now, what happened in the south was mostly due to the Eurozone, the really bad construction of the Eurozone. The Eurozone, it's not a story, it's mostly not a story of sovereign debt crisis. What the mainstream story that it was the profligacy of these states is part of the issue, but it's not the main core of the issue. The, the main reason for Southern Europe's problems is to do with the way that the Eurozone is set up. Uh, it's to do with it not being an optimal currency area. It's to do with the fact that you cannot have the same nominal interest rate for countries that grow fast as countries that grow uh, slow. It's to do with wage policy in Germany. It's to do with re restraining wages in, in Germany and not allowing them to grow, etc., etc. So it's just a badly constructed Eurozone. And as long as we don't recognize this, we don't accept the internal structural problems of the Eurozone, this is going to continue. Look at the German trade sufficit. You cannot have such a massive, huge trade surplus uh, in, in a Eurozone. It's just impossible. Part of the reason is that Germany's firms are very competitive, obviously. Uh, nobody denies that German firms are very competitive. But the other reason for why Germany has such a massive trade surplus is because Germany is not spending anything on the inside. So neither German citizens nor the German state, mostly because of this philosophy of uh, budget restraint within the Eurozone. One country's spending, one country's internal demand, is exports possibilities for the other countries. If Germany doesn't spend in spite of 0% interest rates, you, Germany could borrow today for sometimes negative yields, but mostly almost zero, effectively. If Germany doesn't spend on its infrastructure today, uh, there is no opportunity for the southern Europeans to export. And they will not start growing. Countries like Italy will not start growing if they don't grow. Their banking sectors will collapse, and they will not be able to come out of the crisis, countries like Greece. So that's a huge problem with north vis-a-vis -vis south. There is also, <clears throat> I think, a huge problem west vis-a-vis -vis east. 
uh, the block around Germany versus the Visegrad countries where uh, this kind of demagogy uh, and anti-European extremism has grown. I agree it's not only Hungary and Poland, which are the obvious cases, but as you've pointed out, also the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and, and the rest of the region. Uh, Austria, but also Bulgaria, Romania, I think it's becoming quite general. Now, why is that? That is because that economic model, which characterized Central Eastern Europe, the Visegrad economic model is not feasible. I think it's time to recognize that after 30 years, what this region has become is a low wage, low value added uh, supply platform of the German economy. Wages have not converged, in spite of all the triumphalism of the European Commission, that Eastern enlargement has been a success, people in the region do not feel that it has been a success. No matter how much politicians keep on repeating it, people from Visegrad countries, people from the Baltics even, are leaving in droves. Uh, po natural population growth is negative, uh, emigration is increasing, Increasingly, people are moving to Germany, to the United Kingdom, and other places, which causes things like Brexit, because there is a flood of people for whom the Brits were not prepared. Uh, they were never told when we entered in 2004 that there would be such a, such a, a sudden inflow of so many people. So the, the, the populations of Central and Eastern Europe are not feeling that they have converged. The promise hasn't been fulfilled. And I think there's a reason why they're not feeling it. What is a successful economic convergence? A successful economic convergence is Western Germany after the Second World War. When you come from complete military and economic devastation in 1945, and by the 1960s you have the Wirtschaftswunder, you have the German economic miracle. Uh, within two decades you've come from effective economic collapse to being one of the richest countries in Western Europe. An economic miracle is South Korea. When you come from the level of Zimbabwe in the 1950s, and by the 1970s you're in the first world. It's Singapore. It's countries like that. When in 20, 30 years you, come, you can come from the third world to the first world. Now, what has the Visegrad region achieved in 30 years? It has remained stuck in a very low wage, very low value added uh, kind of re-export basis for the German economy. Uh, we don't have a strong middle class. In those countries, the middle class is extremely weak. Now, I'm completely with Gosta Esping Andersen, a famous theoretician of the Scandinavian model, when Gosta Esping Andersen says that for democracy to work, you need a strong middle class. A strong middle class defined as people who understand the complexities of the debates that we have, and we have extremely complex debates. I mean, to make a decision about the Eurozone or nuclear power stations or the war in Syria, you have to have very, very complex concepts in your head. A small minority of people in those countries actually have those concepts in their heads. Um, in order to be middle class, you have to have material savings which prevent you from being forced into clientelistic networks. A tiny proportion of people in those countries have that material independence. And if you add together the lack of skills, the lack of concepts for a uh, meaningful public dialogue, meaningful public debate, and the lack of material independence, you have, I would say, a single digit percentage of people in the Eastern European periphery who could be considered middle class, who would maintain the kind of democracy which you would expect of those people uh, after 30 years of tra after transition and 10, 15 years after going into the European Union. So unless you go down to that level, unless you start analyzing social structure, middle class, knowledge creation, economic standing, you won't have a real answer. And, I understand, and, and the, the European issues could be managed, but people like Orban don't fall out of the sky. People like Kaczynski don't fall out of the sky. They are elected by people. The reason why they are elected is because the general discourse is at that, those levels of concepts, because of the level of middle classes. 
the majority of people can be um, captured by um, creating opponents, by creating hate speech, by um, basically focusing the attention, for instance, in the Visegrad countries. We have zero refugees in those countries. And if you measure the hatred against refugees, half to two thirds of those populations express some sort of hatred towards those refugees who aren't even there. Um, and, you know, we're talking about 1,320 refugees having to be settled in a country of 10 million in the case of Hungary. How can that debate be shifted towards a situation when two thirds of Hungarians reject refugees and talk of them as economic migrants. It's to do with the fact that this country doesn't have a middle class, so a very, very narrow middle class. Why is that? That's because of the economic model. So if countries in the, in, in the Balkans are aspiring to be Visegrad, I think they're setting themselves a very, very bad model. They're setting themselves a very low bar. Being Visegrad is almost in no ways better than being, uh, being the Balkans. Being in the EU, in this sense, gave us no extra privileges. I don't think that there is such a thing as a common European vision. I, 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 I question whether there is such a thing as a common European vision. Every single time Hungarian, the Hungarian democracy has been debated in the European Parliament, the European People's Party stood behind Viktor Orban. That's something you have to understand. We, in the European Union, you talk about a European vision of democracy, human rights, etc., etc. But when it comes to debating the state of democracy in, for instance, Hungary or Poland, the European People's Party, which is a very, very large parliamentary fraction in the European Parliament and gives a lot of heads of state, actually institutionally uh, endorses Viktor Orban. So from that point on, I do not subscribe, I do not buy this narrative that there is such a thing as European common wisdom. It's, it's there in paper, in very vague terms. It's not enforceable in any reasonable way. When you are in a process of accession, they can, there is something that they can demand for you as long as you're in a process of accession. The moment you enter into the European Union, the European Commission or the European Parliament has almost zero leverage against you. So if you look at the kind of criticisms which have been addressed at the Hungarian government or the Polish government or other governments, and you look at the actual level of enforcement that came after it or the actual level of uh, <coughs> legal competencies that, for instance, the European Commission has, I mean, the gap is massive. There's almost nothing. The European Commission has almost no competencies vis-a-vis -vis a member state. Uh, so, you know, the point I was trying to make is unless, you are, unless the European Union is prepared to look into the economic structure, the fact that there is no convergence in the south, the people from the south are moving to the north, young people are escaping, They're, they see no future for themselves in countries like Greece or Italy. Uh, people from Ireland have fled in massive numbers. People from Estonia have fled in massive numbers. People from Bulgaria, from Poland, uh, from Romania, and increasingly from Hungary and Slovakia as well. I mean, those are the issues that you really have to face, and it's a question of economic structure. And as long as Germany is not prepared to face up to this, as Germany keeps on pretending that uh, it's competitive and therefore it's rich, and it has nothing to do with the way that the economic structures of Europe are set up, I think we're not really addressing the deep underlying issues of the, of the time. That's where it all comes from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have five more, more minutes. If uh, somebody from the audience would like to pose a question, this would be an ideal moment. And I would like to prepare the, 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 the panelists uh, for, for, the, for the opportunity to give the, the closing remarks towards the end of the, of the panel. Uh, I see some, yeah. So hi, my name is Slajan. I come from uh, Faculty of Political Sciences in Serbia. So Mr. Pogac has said that he doubts that uh, such a thing as a European vision, common European vision exists. And we've talked a lot about economics and I would like to pose a question for all of you on the stage. Do common European values exist? Now given the fact that yesterday <laughs> Germany passed a law legalizing same-sex marriage, which is European values, respecting minorities, ethnic 
sexual or otherwise. At the same time, Romania has uh, gathered three million signatures to define a marriage as a marriage between a man and a woman. That's every sixth citizen of Romania. Polish cardinals have crowned Jesus Christ as their king. And they've tried, Poland has tried to pass a total complete, complete blanket ban on abortion. Does a common European value system exist? Or do you have six or seven or three or four value systems inside the European Union? And do you have specific, very differing national cultures? And can Brussels tolerate this? Could you tolerate both a secular and highly secular France and an extremely Catholic Poland, for example? Can mm -hmm. Europe mm -hmm. exist and be so diverse culturally wise, not just economically wise? That's Thank it. you very much. Gentlemen, who would like to take this, this question? My answer would be yes. Because uh, same sex marriage, where I have clear convictions, is. Uh, in Germany, we had the totally different opinion when we created the European Union. Religious issues are very different in different states. By the way, very different in Germany compared with France and also different from, from Poland. I think these differences on the basis of common democratic values and human rights are possible. And I think not that the European Union should uh, impose anything in that direction. So this is the spread. Uh, Trump has different values compared with the Democrats. You have divisions inside the countries, and people voted in different directions in the German parliament this way. I mean, this variety you have. Indirect answer to your... I believe, and this is a controversial debate which we have in Germany, that we should spend more on infrastructure, that we also should increase our wages. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, you quoted the North, are not member of the Eurozone. <laughs> they are doing well. So that they are doing well, obviously, is not only to do, the Germans doing well has not only to do with the Eurozone. Uh, and you did, therefore, I think that, um, and you didn't mention any necessities of countries like Hungary or countries in this region or in Italy to reform. Uh, you describe it, I mean, I'm, I'm saying we should diminish our surplus, there's no doubt. There, I totally agree. But to think that Germany can substitute the reform process which is needed in France and in Italy, I think it's an illusion. And um, uh, to describe these countries as a, as a victim of German economic policy, it's underestimating the necessity for domestic reforms, which were, by the way, difficult in Germany to implement and was very controversial in Germany as well. So I think on this answer, yes, we should invest more, do more, and also increase wages. This is controversial. But if the countries here do not change themselves, even Germany changes would not help them alone. I think on this issue we can ask uh, at the end, in our final statement. You can, you can okay. Questions but, but two questions. The first of all, it's a battle. The, the, the values cannot be imposed or can be decided from above. Because when Germany decided today, it was a battle for many years already in that direction, and still is in Austria, for example. So I think we should not always expect the EU Commission to do it. And I know I agree that the Commission also on the laws in Hungary, nearly all the laws had to be changed, but not enough from my personal point of view. But if we would start to think Europe as some who can permanently interfere in the legislation of some member countries, it would not work. And on the second issue, I must also say, because uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, what you said, uh, Sultan, on many issues on the economic model. But as I've been very often in Greece in the, in the, in the critical years, if Greece is not changing their structure, they never will uh, compete. Yes, Germany must invest more. And in Italy, it's not a question of Italy. It's a question of south of Italy. If you have a bureaucratic, oligarchic uh, uh, structure there, it cannot be done. The mistake was to think it will come automatically with the euro. And the mistake was that we, European Union, was concentrating on cutting wages, cutting pensions, instead of saying to Greece, you have to have a modern state in order to be compatible. 
So I think part of the criticism is right, as I see with Ms. Carsten, but it would um, bring them the wrong message. You don't have to reform. Germany has to do it. So th that is why I react in that way. Yes, both. Germany has to do something, and the economic model cannot be Germany. I agree with that. The economic model must be the model developed after the Second World War with adaptation to the new development, a social economy. And here I would also agree with Dusan Relic said about the, the social inequality. This is a common problem in rich countries and in poor countries that social inequality was neglected very often, that the question of fairness, of, uh, yeah, of equality was put aside. And that I think we common, if member of European Union, member of Eurozone, and uh, um, enlargement members, candidate countries, have to deal much more with the question of inequality, because otherwise we will have for continuous strong vote for populist parties. Right, but uh, look at one country in transition who has really great preconditions for success, and this was East Germany. East Germany received 2 trillion euro from West Germany through the Solidarity Fund. And nevertheless, you have whole landscapes empty of people who left. So it's not only about creating a system which respects uh, all demands of reforms. It's creating a new system which could keep people there. And it's not by coincidence that the greatest amount of supporters for the right-wing and extremist parties in Germany are there, in East Germany, because these people see that their life project has evaporated. But they have been told that what is coming now are blue in the Landschaften, to quote the late chancellor, uh, flowers in the landscape. Uh, and I my feeling is that one of the reasons why we have a crisis in all countries of Europe is that this issue of equality has simply been, especially by those parties who advocate equality, these are social democratic parties, they have inhaled the Washington consensus and the neoliberal model without really considering that this is also ideology, that this is not rocket science. And now we are experiencing in our real life the situation out of this. Thank you, Mr. Reis. Zoltan wanted to reply, and uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Te Teokarevic's question, and we have to wrap up then. Yeah, I never understood this issue of countries like Greece have to reform themselves. I mean, what exactly does it mean that they have to reform themselves? If you mean a more efficient state or less corruption or better ability to collect taxes, the European Union and the Troika has been in charge of Greece since 2010. That country has not been a sovereign state since 2010. The European, uh, the Troika effectively controls tax collection in Greece since 2010. The Greek finance minister does not control tax collection. He is not in charge of the Greek tax office. The Troika has been ch in charge since 2010 of, of tax collection. So, you know, wh who defines economic policy in Greece? The Troika. Who, we, the European... Com the European, exactly, but, that, but, the, but who is the Troika? The Troika is the European Commission. The European Union has accepted a common uh, policy for competitiveness, the Lisbon process, the Europe 2020 process. What does that say? It says we have to be the most competitive macro region of the world based on high value added knowledge, investment into. So that doesn't, there is no word in that strategy which says that if you are a country in crisis, this doesn't apply to you. So if I was the European Commission, before I would sign any memorandum with Greece, I would insist that Greece double its spending on. Uh, education, double its very low spending, double its very low spending on research and development, increase its spending on uh, health care. Where would you find the money for that? Um, that's a, a very long and complicated story, okay. but if you don't, no, it's, there is a solution for it, but this is not the venue where we discuss it, but there's, but actually the problem with Greece was the lack of revenues. It was never the excess expenditure. It was actually very low taxation, tax revenues. So why wasn't that what the European Commission was insisting on in Greece? Why were they insisting on cuts to the human capital formation in that country? Professor Teokarevic has a question, and it will be the last question. 
Thank you. Dushan is very right that the Western Balkans needs money, also the EU money. But my question, actually, something that he's completely aware of, I'm, I'm sure, is uh, where will this, would this money actually end if the, the present clientelistic uh, regimes without the rule of law, uh, procedures, etc., etc., end? Uh, so I would say that the, uh, something that should be done before is actually working much more and also insisting much more from the EU side on, on, on the rule of law uh, here, on uh, fighting corruption and on, on fighting these uh, clientelism actually that would, if things, if money comes pouring in, let's hope, uh, from the EU, will end up in, in, the, in the pockets of wider families of our masters. Thank you. Thank you very much. A brief answer to this question, and we it's, have to finish. The, the European Union cannot change a country from outside against its will. And this means it can only change if the country wants to change, and then you can discuss about the amount of, you can discuss about the direction of change, and you cannot and, but you cannot substitute the internal data. The Greece, the European Union has decided that we only give money if the tax collection system is changed. Greece accepted it and didn't change in the high degree in collecting it. it what I mean... No, it I, has a surplus in the budget. It has because now a surplus in the budget because for the first time they are collecting. Greece I mean, doesn't control its tax collection system. It does not control okay, it. This is uh, a controversy which we are having, and I, your question is going in the right direction. This is the question, how much can an outside factor interfere into the domestic side? On the one side, you have a situation that those countries in this region and in Eastern Europe East, are saying, don't interfere. On the other side, they complain that we don't condition the, the support on changes in the law in Ukraine, on changes of the tech collection in, in Greece. So it's a question where a segment of your population trusts the European Union more than their own leadership. On the other side, the same countries who trust the European Union more than their own leadership complain not only that they don't get sufficient money, but they also complain that we do not interfere more that is given to the right persons. This Thank is the debate which we are having, and I don't know a way out of Thank it. Thank you, Mr. Vogt. Uh, uh, Mr. Relich wanted to add something, and that's... that's oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, gentlemen, I give you two more minutes, to all of you. So. Uh, <laughs> well, well perhaps, perhaps we can agree on the following. Money alone does not help. The money must come to people who are ready to use it efficiently. Secondly, the economic policy of the EU, especially, that is my opinion, especially of the Troika, was catastrophic because it was going in the wrong direction. Now we have a lot of, of uh, taxes and what is coming out? More shadow economy because people want to avoid taxes in Greece, for example. But please, only giving money to more education if the education system is not reformed doesn't help. So I think we should be realistic. Yes, more money is needed, but please, do the reform, do the necessary reform that is efficiently used, <coughs> and you have clear targets. That Thank is you. important. Mr. Elic. Yone, uh, if in this crystal bowl there, were, there was a golden fish, and then I could ask the fish for a wish, then I'd say let's create for the Balkans something analog to the Marshall Fund after the Second World War in Germany, which produced a system in which American money was mostly not sent back to Germany, but used to create a bank, basically, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, which funded small and medium enterprises on strict issues. And here I would also say that a huge part of the money which could come from the European Union should be used in these countries on purpose for research and development and for education. You can control this. Small and medium enterprises, research and education, and a good taxing system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I give extra minute to Mr. Blockmans only because he, he yes. promised to uh, uh, finish on a more positive note. <laughs> Two positive notes. Um, one, one would be um, 
that on the basis of this discussion and of course realities uh, that we have seen play out over there over the last decade in fact in which the EU has been stuck in this euro debt crisis uh, economic and financial crisis is that the new liberal uh, policies which have economic policies which had been um, at driving you know uh, reform have exhausted themselves and that there is a, a bigger need for a socio economic and monetary policy within the European Union and an upward convergence of social uh, criteria which may build into uh, some form of acquis on the eurozone but also on EU trade policy which we haven't discussed much but which has caused a lot of uh, friction amongst populations and the second uh, point would be that the good news or the silver lining from all of these crises is, or from this poly crisis, is an emergence perhaps of, uh, of a European political space which is plugging to some extent the democratic legitimacy gap from which the EU is suffering. It's a difficult debate, but at least we're having it at a national level in national elections. They're turning out on European issues national referenda, and that's an emergence, you know, which is positive. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for this excellent debate. Uh, thank you for being uh, such a wonderful audience. It's a co coffee break now till 12.30. Uh,